Hi everyone! I'm Curran. I'm going to talk to you today about data visualization and education at scale with VizHub. Why though? Everyone with an internet connection should be able to learn how to write code and visualize data. This is what I'm interested in, uh, in realizing, achieving. But uh, there are so many folks around the world who don't have laptops or access to, you know, full-blown laptops, desktops. They just have smartphones. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to focus on developing an, a user interface for editing code on mobile devices. And so this is what is working so far. On the left, there's the view page for a visualization, which is very similar to the view page of uh, blocks.org. You know, where it shows the content and a description and a title and the author. Um, it also shows what it was forked from. And one unique thing about VizHub is the only way to create something is to fork something else. So they all, kind of, there's this lineage where they all go back to the same primordial viz. Here's an example uh, of a visualization made inside VizHub which shows the number of uh, total users that have ever logged in to VizHub. And it's pushing 1,800 now. Um, and this is using the D3 annotation library, which is really cool. And so this slide is a link into VizHub itself. So let me just give a quick demo of VizHub. You can uh, go into full screen mode if you want to present. And there's also an editor that you can open like this. Open editor and then open your files and take a look at the code that produces this visualization. And uh, you can tweak it right here. And this is straight up uh, D3 code. I think it's version 4. Yeah, D3 version 4 style. And the data is also defined right in here. So if I you know, change a data value, it updates immediately to show you this immediate visual feedback when you make uh, changes to the code. And the way it's set up is uh, there's this little blue line. So if I were to start typing, uh, every keystroke, it resets this timer that's indicated by this little blue line. And uh, if you, let me say position fixed, if you stop typing for, I think it's a second or so, then it reruns your code. So that's a, a brief tour of VizHub. And there's also this mini mode where if you want to just focus on the code, which I do for the, the screencast videos that I produce, they, that feature works really well for that. And there's also a fork button. And if you click that, it forks the visualization. So I'm going to click that right now. It says forking. And now I've got this fork. And what I want to do in this fork is project when it might reach 5,000 users. So I'm using the um, Vim key bindings for any Vim nuts out there. If you hit Alt-V, it turns on and off the Vim bindings. So I'm going to copy paste the last row and change the year to uh, 2020. Then we can see we got this big line over there. And what if I change the number to like 2,000? I'm looking for a slope that sort of matches what's there. And that looks pretty close. So VizHub might have 5,000 unique users by, you know, this, this same time next year, for example. So that's a brief demo of what the VizHub software does. Yeah. The primary use case for now is for, uh, is for desktop. Yeah, um, I ended up using this platform to teach my um, online graduate course at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. This is what that looks like. And this was really the core motivation for building VizHub into what it is. Um, this is a 10-week graduate course for graduate students at uh, 
WPI, Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. And I, I taught this online course uh, this year, and this is the third year that I've taught this. And the content is as follows. It's a 10-week course. Week one is overview of data visualization, introduction to web technologies, where we make a face, for example, with SVG and D3 and JavaScript. And then we go through the textbook by Tamara Munzner, amazing textbook, visualization, analysis, and design. So inputs for visualization, data and tasks, where we talk about the types of attributes that you could have. And then marks and channels, how to map attributes of data to visual uh, graphics. Common visualization idioms like bar chart, line chart, area chart, line chart with multiple lines, stacked bar chart, grouped bar chart, stacked area chart, and stream graph. <laughs> this was a little ambitious. I didn't get, didn't get to actually develop all of those. But. And then visualization of spatial data, networks, and trees using color and size in visualization. And then towards the end of the class, we, we get into interaction techniques. And then I teach the technical aspects of making interactive systems with React and D3 combined. Uh, data reduction, like making histograms, focus plus context patterns with brushing and linked views. And then we close out the course with some case studies and then like a who's who of visualization today. So I used VizHub to produce the lecture videos for this course. And then I would send the VizHub link to the students and then have the students fork the visualization that I created in the video and modify it to show their own data or modify it to do whatever. It varies from assignment to assignment. But it's the platform that the students use to do the assignments. And so to submit their work, they submit the VizHub link. And then I get that in the grading system. I was using this thing called Canvas. And I give feedback in the Canvas platform, you know, co do the code review pretty much of their work and give them the grade. So let me give you a sense of what one of these videos looks like, just to get an idea. And I think I was just saying, oh, console.log is the, the greatest thing. And you can say, oh, here it is. Now the code is running here. And oh, I need to explicitly return the thing and you know, make it a function with curly braces. And then sure enough, it says computing x scale. It worked. But this is like deep in the middle of something. And then the brushing, I think this was like the final moment when the brushing started working, which was like a big breakthrough which sort of culminates the course. And then I've got my green screen set up in my home, you know, my studio in India where I live and do this work, um, where I sort of put myself in the video when I want to just tell the students something that's not directly related to the code or action on the screen. And so, yeah, I've gotten really into this activity of video production. I've produced 50, about 50 of these, or 51, uh, leading up to this example with the brushing. Oh, what do I use for the video work? I use OBS, Open Broadcaster Studio, to do, or Open Broadcaster Software Studio, to do the screen capture. And it's actually running right now. I'm recording this right now. <laughs> so that's, it's all going to roll into the video pipeline. And then for video editing, I use Caden Live. It's an open source video editing software that's a little buggy. I mean, relative to things like Premiere, I think is the main commercial version. But I get by. I make it work. Yeah, the main task in my kind of is video editing is editing out the silences and the mistakes that I make. False starts when I start to say something and then just don't remember what I was going to say. I just edit that out. Do you have some mechanism for like versioning? You know, I do not. But it is all backed by this database called ShareDB, which stores the diffs, and it also implements real-time synchronization. So if I open, let me just show you, if I open this same thing in two browser windows and put them side by side, changes from one propagate to the other, which is related actually to the history idea. And one of these could be in full screen mode, for example, and if I add a zero there, 
it updates over there. And so it could work for you know, remote pair programming applications where you know, I could hop onto a, a call with somebody and do a code review or like help them unblock on making a certain feature work uh, with this like Google Docs style real-time collaboration. But coming back to your question about versioning, uh, all the data of the previous versions of things is there. I just haven't built an interface to access the previous versions. But I do want to point out that the VizHub 2.0 roadmap is a public Kanban board. And I've done this to try to engage with uh, people who are actually using VizHub. And so these are the, all the things that I need to implement still. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't even feel close to done, but it's, it's done enough to use to teach the class and to make videos. But uh, version revision history, here it is. And it, it navigates into uh, a discourse instance that I've set up for VizHub, a user forum. And I've set up upvoting on these issues in the user forum. Uh, it's filled with feature requests. And so I tried to phrase it like a user story. You know, as a visualization author, I want to be able to navigate to previous versions, like commits, ideally with thumbnails. That would be so cool, right? If each previous version had a little thumbnail, like a little, a little show reel, like a film reel. And with the option to restore a previous version or fork from a previous version. So these are all things that I want VizHub to be able to do, but it, it's not, it can't do it yet. But what you can do to help is to upvote this issue. And then uh, in here, there's a way to look at you know, things sorted by a number of votes, which helps guide the prioritization for this public uh, Kanban board. Who are, the Who are the most engaged users? Well, so far, let me just pull up the discourse again. So far, it's just people in my course. Because I haven't shared um, this uh, VizHub 2.0 beta version very widely quite yet. It's been more of uh, uh, behind the scenes. It's, it's been in like a, almost like a private beta, where it's been beta tested by my students. And so the people here are mainly students from my course. Which brings me to the next point. I wanted to discuss, which is, so everyone with an internet connection should be able to learn how to write code and visualize data. But how? How is this possible? How, how could we get from here to there? And uh, my plan is a large-scale education initiative, which I'm going to kick off in 2020, consisting of videos and challenges. So it's almost going to be like a a massive public version of this 10-week course that I delivered, where all the videos are sort of private to the students, I'm going to take those videos, rework them, uh, make them better, taking into account the feedback I received from the students, and release them, maybe like one video a day, or one video every two days, uh, going into 2020. And the videos will be just like the one I, the, the one I showed you. And the challenges would be like the assignments. And here's an example of a challenge that I would want to do. Fork one of these examples, and all of these examples are made with uh, Vega Lite API, which is a, a fairly recent initiative from uh, Jeff Hare, who was the advisor to Mike Bostock, who created D3. But Jeff Hare and his crew are working on, there's this whole ecosystem where there's Vega, Vega Lite, and then finally Vega Lite API. And let me show you what that looks like. This is the specification of the visualization right here. It's 23 lines. And this is the only thing you would really need to touch to change the visualization. Uh, for example, if I change field Q, which means field quantitative, to field uh, N, it'll use hue instead of luminance to represent those values because hue makes sense to use with categorical attributes, also known as nominal 
attributes that are distinctly different but don't have a natural ordering between them. But if you change it back to Q, it says, okay, this is a quantitative field, meaning it has a natural ordering, so we should map it instead to luminance, which is what this color scale does. And so there's an ordering in you know, light to dark that corresponds with the ordering of the years. But Vega Light has some limitations, like to customize the format here, I, I don't really know how hard that would be. I know they do have a field T. There is a field T, let me try that. Time. Interesting, it didn't, didn't really do the trick. That's a great question. Is there a way to use saturation to encode this? Yeah, yeah that's a good one. The gray or the older. I gotta try that sometime. That is a great question. So just to rephrase, to repeat the question, what is this import doing? Import VL from Vega Light API? Is it, you know, fetching an NPM package? So what it's doing is, well, let's look at index.html. Here we can see there are, in fact, script tags, standard vanilla HTML script tags that pull in the libraries from Unpackage. And Unpackage, it's a content delivery network backed by NPM. And so for, which is the node package manager, it's like the package manager of the JavaScript ecosystem. And so any library on NPM, you can access through Unpackage at a specific version. And it will load the script onto your page and introduce a global variable. And so what happens when we introduce Vega, that introduces the global called Vega, I think. And Vega Light, Vega Light API introduces a global called VL. And then there's D3 as well. And what happens is we author the file called index.js. And index.js can pull in ES6 modules, standard ES6 modules, for example, viz.js, where we say export const viz. And this is all using rollup internally in vizhub. Nowadays, pretty much everybody is using some kind of module bundler system, maybe Webpack has more traction than rollup, but uh, getting Webpack to run in the browser is tough. I think that's what Code Sandbox does. But if you open the network tab, when you open Code Sandbox, you'll see that it pulls in like 12, 13 megabytes of stuff. And I think it has to do with Webpack somehow. I, I don't really understand it. But Rollup does much of the same stuff that Webpack does, including bundle ES6 modules together. And so your question about the imports uh, has to do with Rollup. So index.js is what you author, and then every time you make a change and that timer runs out, it regenerates, as in VizHub internally using Rollup, regenerates bundle.js, which is what gets included in the HTML. So it's loading this bundle.js, which is a compiled, transpiled, bundled version of index.js using Rollup. And Here's where we get to the part about the imports. Notice that it's passing in Vega, Vega Lite, VL, Vega Tooltip, and D3 into there <coughs> from globals. And so when we import VL from Vega-Lite-API, VizHub internally needs to know how does this package name resolve to a global? And so there is a mapping, which I've made into an open source uh, thing, VizHub libraries. And all it is, is a mapping from package names to global variables. And so this is one of the er areas of VizHub where, I don't know if this was exactly the right design choice because every library that, or every package that you want to use this import syntax with, you have to make a small change to this 
and then wait for a redeploy of VizHub for it to work. So that's one of the sort of drawbacks of the approach, but it doesn't mean you can't use those libraries. It just means you'll have to use the globals directly as you normally would anyway if you didn't have a module bundler. So my hope is over time, you know, the most commonly used libraries will make their way into here. Like I've got all the D3 packages and all the React packages. Three is there and Vega and friends. These are the libraries that are compatible with the import syntax from package names. Is file editable in this hub? Uh, it's not. That was one of the things that in the first version of VizHub it was editable and that caused no end of confusion with the students because they say, oh, if I edit bundle.js, it'll just update and work. <laughs> but it's like, no, no, no. So I, 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 I did some things in this version of VizHub, which is the 2.0 beta version, where the file name is slightly grayed out up there and also it's grayed out there and there's this little tooltip here that I don't know how discoverable this is, but uh, it just tells you this file is generated automatically from index.js. It, it, it says here, it combines all modules imported by index.js into a single file. Each time any JavaScript changes, this file is regenerated. Editing this file manually does not make sense, so it is not allowed by the editor. Yeah, like this is an opportunity to educate the user about this whole phenomenon of bundling, which people just don't know about if they've never done JavaScript before, which half of my students are fall in that category. Yeah. Parcel, yeah, nice. That's another one. That's another one that competes with Rollup and Webpack. But in terms of getting any of those to run in the browser, I, th I found Rollup to have the least friction, and it works. And it uh, transpiles JSX, which lets you use React. But before we get to there, I want to say uh, this is an example of one of those challenges that I would say. After maybe a couple of videos, I'll introduce Vega Lite and give a challenge. Fork one of these, change the data, change the color, experiment, play around, and then share the link in uh, maybe I'll have a Slack group or something or a Twitter hashtag, VizHub, you know. And to give a sense, this is what one of my students did over the weekend by forking one of those examples. Um, I did a, a weekend workshop at Stamen Design this past weekend where it was four hours each day. First day was on visualization theory and the second day was on visualization practice. And this is the practice exercise. And this is showing commute flows in California by county. And so notice up here we've got Los Angeles County, Orange County, and the diagonal is commutes within the same county. And so Los Angeles to Los Angeles has the highest number of all of these. And an example of how VizHub uh, worked well in, in the workshop setting is she first made a first pass of, that, of this that did not use a log scale. Actually, I can show you really easily what that looked like. She didn't have type equal log. And so if I get rid of type equals log for the scale, uh, this is what you see. And so during the workshop live, she made this and then I was like, that looks like it needs a log scale. And then so I could like type or I think what happened is I gave her that suggestion. She saw another example that had a log scale and I happened to have this full screen projected as she was still editing it. And so she made a change you know, to switch on the log scale on her computer and then boom, it showed up on my computer on the projector in real time. And it was like this magical moment of like, oh my God, this is what VizHub is for. You know, this is what it's supposed to do. It's gonna enable these sort of collaborations that weren't really possible before. So I wanna point out something really cool about this viz is, see this square here? There's kind of a square there and there's kind of a long rectangle going down over here. And I don't know all of these counties, but I think the top ones are closer to LA. And the bottom ones beneath this line are, close, are closer to San Francisco. Is that right? Orange County, San Diego County, Santa Clara County. And so that indicates a clustering sort of a phenomenon where these are tightly connected counties and these are tightly connected counties. Alameda, Alameda San Francisco, Ventura County, Sacramento County. 
There is, yeah, it's so, there is a sorting. That's right. Yeah, you could reorder either column, or either axis, you could reorder arbitrarily using different algorithms. That's something I've been wanting to get into, because Jacques Bertin did that in his book, The Semiology of Graphics. He had some crazy algorithm for figuring out like the optimal sorting of a matrix like this. But that's like something else, future work. My point with this is that the student created this within 15 minutes of me showing this slide. And it's just so amazingly rapid how fast uh, new visualizations can be created. And here's the lineage in the forks tree of this visualization. It was forked by that red heat map, which was in turn forked by that uh, blue thing over there. This is just, uh, it's content in VizHub arranged by the forking lineage. So it's a visualization of all the visualizations. I don't know who did it, who, who did these or at what times. Um, this, this visualization could, could use a lot of iteration, like maybe putting little avatars, like who did it? Because I don't know who did each one of these. I just happened to find this while uh, browsing through this thing. But this to me is one of the most magical aspects of VizHub, is that you've got this full forking lineage and imagine, like, that could be so useful inside of a company where you take one of these as a starting point and maybe fork it and modify it to show some client's data. Um, and this is all futuristic. There's nothing private in VizHub yet. But once there is, it's going to be really great. Uh, so imagine a, you're a design firm or something or working on visualizations for clients. You can show the clients using this view, the history of the work and the different versions and allow them to comment. And I want to have comments in VizHub too. But before I get carried away, I want to show you more of these, these lineage visualizations. And I'm going to open up this one in a new tab because that's the interactive one. But it takes forever for the images to load. It's a rough prototype that's not optimized at all. So while those images load, I'll show you these slides. This is a cool one. I think this might have been somebody following along with all my YouTube videos because they start with the smiley face with the red eye and then fork that to make a bar chart and fork that to make a scatter plot and fork that to make other scatter plots. And then more bar charts lead to these other scatter plots over here which end up as line charts. And it's just fascinating to see how one chunk of code evolves and changes over time. See, all these lines, they go back to something that's off screen, which I think is my original face example that I published and had a YouTube video for. So my theory is that they forked from that and then just kept modifying and forking their own stuff to create this tree here. Here's another cool section with the maps. See, this was, these were forked, I think, from my original map template that I had a video with. And somebody changed the projection, changed the colors, changed the colors more, made it into a choropleth change the colors scale for the choropleth. And in a way, I found that people um, use forking as a means of version control because there is no notion of a commit yet. Uh, the only way to store a version of your work is to fork from it and then continue working off that fork, which people do end up doing. So maybe that's you know, one, one way of using VizHub that I could focus on or make it work better. More cool maps. It'd be interesting if you could just like see true genealogy of it, right? Yes, totally. And I, I want to do something related to that, which is computing the edit distance between the adjacent things that are, when, like, between, for example, this one and this one, how many lines of code have changed? Okay. So and that could be a weight on these edges. And it could also be a, a filtering function because. I find that maybe more than half of the content in VizHub is just people who have forked mostly the stuff that I made and didn't change it at all. And so it's all this noise. So if I could somehow filter out the noise, um, and I also added an upvoting feature, which it's a little up arrow, you can add upvotes. And so that's going to eventually feed into some kind of uh, presentation on the home page or featured content or something like that. There's so many directions to go. Yes. Yeah. 
Right, right. But when I see a lineage like this, this indicates to me that the student took, they, start, they started coding from the face, but then followed the videos and produced each of these steps by themselves, which, which is really cool. You know, coding each step of the way. And I, I want to capture the, the moments where things from one viz feed into something down the line, but it's not the thing that it was forked from. It's almost like merging a piece from something else. Uh, and so that would be cool to see like a graph data, that would be a graph data structure. And maybe like dotted lines to show like, oh, it has some content that was copy pasted from this thing way over there. That would be really cool. It's all, the data's all there, it just needs to be teased out. You know how like block builder you can change the online? Totally, totally. And there's this, a notion of um, a visual editor. The idea is that in addition to editing code, to make m modifications, there will be some kind of a configuration or state that lives outside of the code that, like if I send a VizHub link to like uh, a manager of a project, he could easily like change the color with a color picker and see it reflect immediately. So there's a, a lot of, whole bunch of opportunities to make an, an editing interface for non-coders. And I think that could be really powerful. So you will be doing it, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But you see a proliferation of visualizations. And here's an example where they started with, uh, looks like my line chart. Because in the video where I made the map, I, t I started with the line chart and transitioned into the map. So it looks like somebody started with my line chart, made a messed up map, and then they asked me for help. I remember this student. He's like, my projection's all messed up. And then it, it ended up being Massachusetts. And then you can see it evolve to uh, this map showing Massachusetts, Massachusetts school districts. And now this has loaded, this is the interactive version. So this is an actual interactive zoomable map of the VizHub content. And I love just going in here and poking around because it changes all the time. And there are new, you know, leaves growing all the time. It's, it's really mind-blowing. And uh, it's so flat and vertical because there was a data glitch where uh, the forks lineage was lost for some early VizHub content and for like a couple weeks, a couple months ago. So, but I, I want to algorithmically backfill the lineage by doing an algorithm something like this. For each visualization that doesn't know what it was forked from, compute the edit distance between that visualization and all other visualizations that were published before it, and take the one with the smallest edit distance and consider that as the nearest ancestor. Well, in terms of how to compute the edit distance, I already have some ideas for how to do that because when you, um, when you make a change in VizHub and it propagates that diff, there is sort of a language for, the, for those diffs. And there's a piece of code I, I have, there's an open source library where you give it two data structures, JSON data structures, and it computes the diff in terms of this diffing language that is used by ShareDB for the real-time synchronization. And I think just the length of that diff represented as JSON, like the number of characters in that diff could be a, rep a representative edit distance. Or but this is, this is something I want to evolve and optimize um, and integrate into the VizHub product. Like if I'm looking at this piece, I want to have a little portion of the page for this visualization show this, you know, the things that were forked from that. That would be super cool. And also where did it get forked from? And what was that forked from? And go back in time, and which is tough with this layout because some of these, uh, some of these jumps are really extreme. But here's somebody who made it purple and never looked back. <laughs> well, this is actually a visualization with D, done with D3 that's actually inside of VizHub. Um, so I could compute those sort of things, like for each visualization, how deep is it? it the data's all there to be derived, but I haven't looked at that. But with great power comes great responsibility. 
what would you visualize? If you could visualize anything, what to visualize? And my personal interests for what to visualize include climate change. There's so much data related to climate change. You could make maps of vulnerable areas. You could do like the, the climate history, ancient history, ice core data of the CO2 levels and the temperature. I want to see some of that content in VisUp. Space exploration. You know, how far is Mars really? I don't have a clear sense because all these, you know, solar system diagrams and the kids' books about space, they're all distorted. You know, it's not actually to scale. You're using log scales on the distance and the size, and it's so confusing because I really want to know how big the planets are and how far away the moon is and so that sort of stuff. I think you could get to there with a lot of zooming. You know, have some cool zooming interface. Human suffering. I want to visualize human suffering to make people more empathetic to their fellow humans. Um, human suffering in all its forms, like poverty, uh, starvation sort of stuff, you know, uh, in income distribution around the world, uh, various disease burdens in different countries. What's your name? Like long term pain? Oh, there's tons of data out there. I, I, this is very high level. I mean, there, there's thousands of different diseases, right? Uh, one compelling map I saw was um, AIDS visualization, where the, the, the prevalence of AIDS is so high in uh, southern Africa, it's mind-blowing. And we think of AIDS as nobody has AIDS around here. You know, I don't know anybody. Well, I don't mean to diminish it, but... Uh, it's, th there are problems that humans face all around the world that privileged people, like many people in the Bay Area, aren't even aware of. And so I want to bring awareness of human suffering to the forefront of people's minds through visualization. So the value of the CDC, like can tell right? Yeah. And the CDC is a great source of, of data sets to mine and visualize. It's a great source. So much good stuff in there. Uh, demographic data, uh, computer science, visualiz visualization of algorithms, that sort of thing. Uh, visualizations for teaching Ancient history, I'm also fascinated by. Like, if you go back before 1900, way before, uh, there's probably some really cool data sets out there to be discovered. And I want to see a visualization where you could start with, you know, your own lifetime as a line, and like, oh, this is about when I'm going to die. But if you zoom out, it would go back and back and back and back until you reach those, uh, what is it called? Cenozoic, uh, Mesozoic... Epochs. Epochs. Exactly. Because I want to I wanna know, what is my context in this universe? Like, where's my place? Uh, news and current affairs is another area where I would love to see VizHub used more. You could even, uh, one use case I would love to actually work is to create graphics for newsrooms or for data journalism. Make the thing in VizHub uh, and embed it into a news article. That would be really cool. So how to make all this a reality. I'm not going to spend all the time to do all this work myself. But if I give challenges to other people, like if I provide a data set, like if I find the ice core records of the Vostok ice core that go back billions of years, uh, or millions, I don't know, and ask, like, what's the trend over time? I could make that an assignment or a challenge to these, this vast viewership of these videos in 2020 and say, you know, sketch some ideas out and visualize it by forking and modifying. So essentially, I want to visualize all the things with React and D3 and create this sort of a machine that will crank out visualizations. And already, if you look at the homepage of VizHub, it updates every day. There's like 10 new visualizations every day. And so I want to make that happen more uh, with higher quality content with more originality and I want to encourage those sort of things like originality I, I'm not sure how to do it but there's a lot of directions to go which begs the question what could you do with react and d3 anyway uh, and and my videos there's a whole series that builds up ultimately to this one with the brushing. This is the migrant deaths data set. 
which was uncovered at a D3 meetup years ago and originally vis visualized, I think, by uh, Bo Erickson. And so this is sort of a, a, a re-implementation of his idea with modern tooling. It's showing uh, migrant deaths over time. So each circle represents an event during which someone died trying to reach or stay in Europe. And the size of the circle is the total number of dead and missing for that event. And on the bottom, there's a date histogram where we're using a D3 brush to filter what's shown on the map. And so looking at this, you can see trends and patterns that you would otherwise never see just by looking through the spreadsheet. For example, there's a huge surge of events around, uh, well, around this region. Libya, north of Libya, there's tons of events. But Syria Yeah, you don't see many events in Syria itself. I mean, they can make it to Libya just fine. Is that where the crossing is? Well, they have to cross the ocean at that point. This is, yeah, that's the and uh, this data set also has cause of death, which is uh, one of which is drowning, and the vast majority of deaths are caused by drowning in this data. And one thing that surprised me was, um, see, look at that huge upsurge in this area right there. Yeah, no, it's, it's, that, that is a known spot. Right, exactly, exactly. I mean, this is where you put Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, there are m many more things you could do with this data. So you can create a lot of stuff with React and D3, and here's one thing that the students made. One of my students forked that example to make this example here which is a visualization of uh, nuclear detonations over time, which has the same brushing feature. And it also has uh, some drop-down menus. Is this up 2.0 publicly available, even if it's not like open enterprise? It is. If you go to vizhub.com, this link here, it says try vizhub 2.0 beta, which takes you to beta.vizhub.com, which is publicly visible. Oh, I've gotten into this cool stuff with these geometric patterns. Uh, with Eric Rodenbeck at Stamen, he turned me onto this stuff. The Vedic Square, it's really cool. But anyway, these are some of the works that the students made, pulling in stuff from different examples. And it's all part of this Forks lineage. But why would you use VizHub anyway? Well, it's easy to develop and publish code in the browser. You can import standard HTML. There's a lot of fresh content there. Uh, it supports ES6 modules. You can import libraries from NPM packages, export work to downstream workflows, and all public content is MIT licensed. So you can fork it off into proprietary projects if you want to. And I just put, put up this uh, Kickstarter to try to raise money for further development of this. So there's a lot of text, but there's also some interesting imagery of uh, what VizHub looks like now. And also I want to show you these designs that I hired Stamen Design to come up with, these user interface designs. So these are some of what I'm going to implement next as the platform continues to evolve. Like this really cool home page design with the little user thumbnails. Uh, the notion of teams and visualizations belonging to teams and collaboration features around that. Uh, comments section and a timeline of events, like who forked which thing uh, at which time. And then there's the eventual pro features like private visualizations, private collections, and uh, white label embedding, where you could, visualize, you could embed a visualization without any backlink to VizHub. So it would be like your own thing, but actually coming from uh, VizHub. And uh, that's pretty much where we're at with VizHub. Thanks for listening.